Ladies and gentlemen, uh, all guests, uh, we are starting now the first part of uh, today's of this event, InfraBeam event, uh, titled in a Smart Infrastructure. It will be divided into three parts, into three sessions, and the session uh, I'll be providing, I'll be moderating with Sylvia Pivovar, uh, representing the British Embassy in Warsaw as a director and uh, central Europe uh, lead for uh, infrastructure at the Department of um, for International Trade. Hello, Sylvia. Hello, Marek. Thank you. Hello, everyone. This conference is a, a joint initiative uh, of the Department for International Trade and uh, SPI, Specialist Project Integration, who worked together over the last few years and uh, came to the conclusion that innovative technologies in infrastructure are one of the key topics within the industry. So countries and investors dedicate significant budgets to improve the infrastructure, such as railway networks, such as roads, airports, ports, uh, buildings, facilities. Therefore, for governments and investors, it is essential that the projects are delivered on plan. Yeah. Our experts uh, will uh, share the knowledge, lesson learned, best practice uh, gained through delivering complex infrastructure projects. We we'll talk about the BIM uh, implementation strategy and how the other markets could adapt it. Uh, we also will highlight uh, some additional benefits of taken from BIM, um, which are not visible at first glances, such as uh, um, quality, environmental and, and financial issues, as well as health and safety aspects. And now, I would like to invite to the stage Mr. Richlov Menza, Regional Director for the, for the Department for International Trade, uh, to officially open uh, this session. Richlov, over to you. Good morning, everyone. My name is Richlov Menza. I am the UK's Regional Director for Trade and Investments in Eastern and Central Europe. I'm absolutely thrilled to welcome you all on behalf of the Department for International Trade, which has become a patron for this year's edition of InfraBIM. I am honored to be involved in this international multi-conference, which is the largest beam focused event in this part of Europe. I would like to thank and welcome the organizers of today's event the European BIM Certification Centre, ECC BIM, and InfraTIM, as well as the distinguished patrons, partners, and all participants. It is really good to see that, despite the pandemic, the organisers have managed to continue this initiative and to hold this fantastic event virtually today. I'm also aware that initially, Today's event was dedicated to the Visegrad markets. With the support from many colleagues across Europe, we have secured the presence of participants from the UK, the wider Central Europe region, and the Baltic states. To put it simply, today's event is about the countries that make up the Three Seas Initiative, plus valuable partners, including the UK. The main theme of today's event is building information modeling, which is the first truly global digital construction technology and will soon be deployed in every country in the world. It is a game changer. And as such, it is one of the top priorities of the UK government's industrial strategy. Construction is a sector where Britain has a strong competitive edge. We have world-class capability in architecture, design and engineering. British companies are leading the way in delivering sustainable solutions across all the construction stages. The UK's program based on the BIS BIM long-term strategy is currently one of the most ambitious and advanced centrally driven programs in the world. In the UK, building information modeling level two 
became mandatory for use on all public sector works as far back as 2016. Through this government-led initiative, industry responded rapidly and very positively with large-scale adoption of BIM. The UK is now recognised as one of the leading nations in the exploitation of BIM technology and processes. The current pandemic has adversely affected economic activity in all sectors, including infrastructure, which of course is the backbone of many economies. Fortunately, most governments in this region and beyond believe that infrastructure investments will play a key role in restarting our economies. This will have a positive knock-on effect on the construction sector and a wide range of supply chains linked to infrastructure development. There are a lot of new infrastructure projects planned for this region. To name but a few, the construction of the central transportation hub here in Poland, the construction of rail Baltic line, which will link Finland, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, and Poland. The construction of a high-speed line connecting Warsaw and Budapest. And the development of airports, seaports, roads, motorways, and a whole host of other infrastructure activities across the region. In all these exciting projects, BIM could help the investors and other stakeholders. Today's event gives us the opportunity to identify where our mutual challenges, goals and solutions overlap. We will be able to share our expertise to the benefits of all partners. I believe that InfraBIM will be a platform for exchanging the latest information from the industry on innovative technologies. I would like to take this opportunity to welcome you to also take part in Smart Infrastructure Conference organized by my department, the Department of International Trade and Specialist Project Integration, which will start soon after the opening ceremony. During the conference, you'll have the chance to learn about the UK's capabilities in BIM using case studies from some of our projects, such as cross through Air Force expansion. Additionally, the conference will show innovative digital solutions from various perspectives and will present experience of other European markets as well. I hope that this will be a very fruitful event and I wish you all the successes. Thank you very much and enjoy the day. Thank you, Rich Love. Um, I have to admit uh, that it is really fantastic that we have managed uh, to gather so many experts from so many countries and markets. Thank you again. Uh, it is for the first time at the InfraBIM. Let's now look at the BIM process from the perspective of one of the most experienced practitioners and strategists, the Fellow of Institute of Civil Engineering, who was working on unique infrastructure projects, to name only the UK Channel Tunnel, Hong Kong Airport, Crossrail and Heathrow. Let me invite Phil Jackson from BIM Institute. Phil, it's over to you. Good morning. Uh, my name is Phil Jackson. I am essentially a civil engineer. Uh, the first half of my career I spent uh, designing and building uh, roads and bridges and then got involved in asset management of uh, assets uh, and uh, only latterly have I got involved in um, information technology and this wonderful world of BIM that we hear so much about. Uh, now we only have a short time uh, and so I looked at what I wanted to say and then really said to myself I really want to get across one simple message out of these, this, this presentation. So really there's a core message to what I'm saying uh, uh, and uh, that's what I want to get across. Uh, so BIM is a lot of words and a lot of promises. We see advertising uh, promises from all sorts of people and but it is widely misunderstood. 
and, and it, it means different things to so many different people. But at the core, it's all about information. Forget the B, forget the M. Core of the whole of BIM is information. The capture of information, the creation of new information, and the flow of information through the life cycle of any particular asset, whether that be a physical one or whether it be an environmental one, uh, it's that flow. And it's about the right information to the right person, to the right team, to the right place, at the right time, to fulfill a defined information requirement. It is not just about 3 software or 3D CAD. Like maybe where much of this started, uh, uh, and of course it means a lot to actually be able to see a 3D view of what it is we're either managing or designing or creating. It's a key thing, but it isn't the core of what we're doing. And buying software doesn't buy BIM. You can't go out and buy BIM off the shelf. It's about information, as I say, and information is an asset. We so often forget that part of what we own is the information about what we own or what we're designing or what we're building. An asset means value. Those things have value and information has value. We work hard to create it. We work hard to gather it. Surely we should be managing it in a proper way. So the M in the BIM now becomes management of our information. And of course the problem we get and the confusion arises because there are so many players. There are so many people involved with a wide spectrum of processes and tasks to carry out and a wide range of interests. Uh, you might be just a designer or a sub-designer designing a particular part of a job. You've got a job to do with information you need. You might be an asset owner. You need your information about that asset. Each has their own information needs. Each can reap benefits from using BIM. There are many benefits to be achieved by using BIM modeling for a particular building task or design task or even construction task. And within their own sphere, these, there are those individual benefits that can be reaped and gleaned and used. But actually, if we can bring those benefits together and get the information to flow, then working together, we can multiply those benefits to ourselves and to all the others involved. So, just a very headline view of who are those players and why are they so different? Well, first of all, we actually have the asset owner, the operator, the manager. They, they, they're, they're dealing with information about their asset and knowledge about it, but they need information to understand and manage and operate and maintain their assets. They need information to manage the interventions and projects that impact their assets, and they need to be able to model the behaviour of their asset in practice. And the supply chain, which is often where a lot of BIM talk happens, it, 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 we need information about that asset or to create new assets, to plan them, design them, construct them and maintain them. But we're doing it around about an asset. And external and public bodies, of course, can give us information about our assets or relating to our assets, uh, but also they need to receive information about our assets. So th th those can be public authorities, uh, utilities, uh, uh, and, but also the public need to be informed. And as we as we go much more towards a uh, a connected society, then those pieces of information will become more and more important to the public. So those spheres each have a very different view of what BIM might mean to them, but BIM is important. And the promises, the promises of this 
they're huge. They're widely advertised. There are management consultants, books about them. There are, there are every time you turn a technical journal page, there'll be something about uh, what you should be doing in digitizing. And the promises are many and they're significant. Uh, and we need to work on actually realizing those, but they aren't always realized. They, 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 they're realized in bits, but actually realizing it in total takes work. And those promises depend on who you are and in what part of the life cycle of information flow that you get involved in. So looking at that information flow, we can start to identify why this is such a set of mixed up uh, views. Uh, so if we're looking at the information life cycle flow, and no, I've just done this in the supply chain intervention, but it works all the way through those, those people who own asset information. Uh, we need information about the existing assets when we're going to plan them. We coordinate across a wide range of players, the businesses that we're dealing with, the public, the authorities, external planners, internal planners, creating virtual options uh, and comparisons with the data and information that allows us to do that and to be able to budget on, on those plans. So planning is a big part of what we do. It creates information, gathers information. Then we go into design, the early beneficiary of what we might call BIM tools. And there we're gathering information about existing assets, gathering information from planning, gathering from other bodies, collaborating across all the tasks that we carry out and all the subtasks that we carry out in doing that to be able to build virtually what we're going to build physically and to do things like clash detection, both physically and in time. Often a precursor to why we should use BIM, we should be able to get uh, clash detection right uh, at a, uh, or clash prevention right at least uh, during that design process but then to be able to validate and verify that information so that we now know we've got good quality information and to simulate build and to pre-plan how we build to get accurate costs and build progressive information about what we're, uh, uh, we're, we're about to uh, uh, design. Flowing on from that construction, we start with quality information about the design virtual asset if we pass that information through. We plan how do we construct the information to do that. We plan the information and materials and products. We plan our logistics and we create progressive information about the as-built of what we're, what we're doing. Um, I happen to think that BIM is much underused here but beginning to grow and actually probably is a huge part of the benefit cycle. We forget this often, but actually when we've actually built it, we do need to test it and validate it and hand it over. So we validate the construction against what we designed. We sign off the quality. We sign off what we've built into handover to operation so that when we get into operate and manage, which is why we've built the thing or why we're managing the thing, we start with fully validated as built information. And that information is a continuous process. Lots of interventions, information that measures the performance of the asset, not just what it looks like, but what, how it performs. Information to model their behavior for traffic management, mitigation of issues, disaster planning. Information that's required to op by the operating systems for signaling and flood monitoring and structural behavior, all those things. Information that's required for asset intervention, intervention uh, information required for maintenance and repair. These happen during this period and should be treated just like a design and construct. And there are many and minor, minor projects. They are part of the information flow. So core to all of this, central to all of this, and what we learned when in the UK as we as we went through our BIM journey and that was 
what we've learned is that our information is matured, our ideas have matured into an information exchange process. And note I say process, it's really important that BIM is a process as much as it is a model. And we've embodied that in ISO 19650 standards, which are now international and an internationalized version of the standards that we started to develop way back in 2011, 2012, when we did the UK BIM strategy. And central to that process is clear exchange requirements defined for each player, for each task and contracted in the delivery. So the important key here is actually it's about information and the pitfalls that we see are many, but I just want to highlight a few. Asking for BIM will not deliver BIM. The asset owner should, and client should take note. If you just ask for BIM and the client to do BIM or the designer to do BIM, you might get coordinated information, uh, coordinated designs and no clash detection, but you won't get the information you need to manage your asset or even to manage your project. Software tools and the use of them create information, but they aren't BIM. They create information, manipulate information that actually needs to be used in a wider context. So planners, designers, contractors, take note. It, it, you don't buy a piece of software that gives you BIM. You buy software that helps you create the information that allows you to do BIM. And then assuming that all that information can be held in one big BIM model, we have found is not practical or sensible and so ISO 19650 and many thoughts now are built on being able to federate lots of information in, from different sources together uh, and rather than build one huge model. All concerned, take note. So my one simple message, understand what information you need to do your job and to fulfill the project and asset information requirements that you're involved with. Articulate that clearly. Define it as a delivery. Make the delivery an open and not proprietary format. I don't mind if you create information with a proprietary tool, but when you start to share it, when you start to exchange it, do it in an open format so that everyone else can use it. And it's not a, a pseudo open, proprietary format, but a real open format, and then make it part of the contract. It is the key to being able to get through this maze of BIM and delivering. So thank you for listening. I uh, hope it's been edifying. Uh, uh, and uh, you know, you'll probably see that I want to uh, look at the information, 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 who needs it? What is it? What is it? Where is it? How do you gather it? That's the key to bringing all of those things together in a federated way. Thank you very much indeed. Phil, thank you very much for your presentation. It was uh, good to hear about the process from such experienced person. We really appreciate your views on benefits as well as on challenges of BIM. As you may know, uh, the aviation sector is facing some challenges. Uh, you will now learn more about uh, Heathrow's uh, digital transformation program from Nigel Stroud. Uh, he has uh, over 30 years experience um, in construction and extensive knowledge about digital technologies. Nigel, over to you. Welcome. My name is Nigel Stroud. I work for Heathrow's digital program. I've worked on projects such as Terminal 5 and Terminal 2, implementing our digital requirements and ensuring efficient use of our data. I've also worked in engineering, where I've gained experience from our end users who actually use our information. This is a short presentation around our digital program, including our journey 
and some of the foundations already in place. It's been a challenging year. At the beginning of the year, we were building up an expansion program, which was going to deliver a new runway. Unfortunately, a judicial review has put that program on pause. This has created an enormous amount of work to ensure that we actually safeguard all the digital data. And then in March, COVID created an unprecedented situation on a reduction of passenger numbers. This has happened across the world to the airline industry. The effect for Heathrow has made us immediately change our business and operating model. We have gone from growth to survival. However, with this business challenge, we do have an opportunity in getting value out of digital. I'm sure you'll all recognize some of these digital, digital challenges. You know, data is not always available when we need it to make those informed decisions. And we don't often speak the same digital language and our landscape is disjointed and hard to connect. Standardize, standardization is, is not there. And we don't fully understand or appreciate the value of data across our organization. And there's often a data handoff between teams and processes, which is often inefficient and unstructured. There's always that look for that golden thread. So what we're doing is establishing a digital ecosystem that enables Heathrow to be data driven. We've created this digital program to drive efficiency and to enable a more variable cost base. So we want to win our recovery and build back better by supporting Heathrow while we scale up, keeping our operational costs down. Where do we start? Establishing a solid digital foundation is critical to our success. While each component of the foundation is important, capabilities can be developed progressively and the value obtained before everything is in, is in place. Establishing that true common language across the airport, our data governance, implementing our digital strategy, master data management, a quality framework, looking at our cost and work and asset breakdown structures and our enterprise model. Developing and enhancing a suite of digital capabilities can then be accomplished from that foundation where we can start to look at different user cases around security transformation, our heat rate, Heathrow gateway lifecycle, things like passenger flow, our common data environment, health and safety, carbon reporting, and things like asset performance. As capabilities start to come together, we can start to create some of our first type digital twin examples, creating that virtual Heathrow We're already looking at getting value out of some of our early adopter projects. So here our new common data environment has started to extract value for the project teams around scheduling, cost, health and safety. This has enabled us to start to calculate the value and the benefits that we get from introducing some of these new technologies and processes. As we start to build up our capability, there will be a varying data maturity and volume and quality across the business. But the enhanced transparency allows us to start to trust, share and reuse that information. Having a greater understanding of our data drives further opportunities to exploit and gain insights through our universal data lake and our insights platform 
we can create that virtual Heathrow, improving the productivity and sustainability, creating that golden thread where information can be at your fingertips, secure but accessible to all business areas, creating that true virtual Heathrow. Let's now take a look at some of our digital foundations. Our common language is our data structure, our classification system. It takes a locational view of all our information across Heathrow, starting from location down to level, space, system, and down to the individual assets. This enables us to connect our systems together, whether it's documents, engineering, or our visualization models. This example shows how important that data structure and classification is. A simple airfield ground light these are the lights that you see across the runway and taxiways on airports. In graphical terms, it's a really simple object, but the specification behind it has a lot of data. These get embedded into contracts so that when our designer creates a new light, they're delivering the information as we require. That allows us to integrate into our visualization and mapping tools. If there's a fault across the airport, then our engineers will pick up a work order within their engineering system. That same light will have the same reference, the same classification, so that it will actually show them where that light is on the airport in our visualization tools. And we also link that to our mobile inspections we go out and inspect our airfield on a regular basis. So again, that same reference to that AGL light is picked up on mobile devices for inspecting where there are faults where lights are not, not working. So this really shows the link between structured, shareable and usable data. Taking this example further, we have smart engineers they utilize the engineering maintenance system to get notification of faults. They can now get their faults on a mobile device. For instance, if a facility's lights go out, then the engineer needs to find out where that distribution board is that are affecting those lights before they can go out and actually make the repairs. They will use the mobile device to get information about the fault and they will click on a link that will then take them to a view of the room where that distribution board is in. So we're linking our maintenance system with our mapping system that's giving value to the engineers who are going out responding to those faults. Making operational decisions, for example, where we have an incident of snow that's covering our taxiways and stands. Here, we link dynamic data to static based data, where we can see the positions of aircrafts, snow clearing vehicles, and the statuses of each of the stands as they're being cleared. Using that structured classified data enables this to happen. Our common data environment future state will provide an Office 365 type environment for managing our asset information. It will be next generation ready so that we can interact with information similar to how we do socially. It will provide a collaborative environment where a single source of asset information can be developed through its entire life cycle. File-based transactional information exchange will be eliminated so that we can have visibility of information through design, build and into operational use we will create a foundation for future innovation and connectivity. Our focus is on connected data. We've started our common data environment implementation with three core systems, our Autodesk BIM 360, our ESRI mapping solution, and Business Collaborator for all that record and control and insights. 
these really form the core data environment that will enable us to interface with other digital twin type activities such as sensors, cost, schedule and asset maintenance. With this core environment in place, we can exploit connected data further where we can optimise the passenger journey. We can create smart buildings. We can have smart transport systems, asset tracking and predictive monitoring and maintenance. This will enable a number of digital twins to be developed to create that virtual Heathrow. Thank you. Thank you, Nigel. It was great to hear it from the perspective of the investor and one of the largest, the biggest uh, airport in Europe. Uh, we are looking forward to hearing from you more during uh, the discussion today. On budget, on time, practical site of successful project delivery. Those key aspects will be now presented by Simon Ray, the founder and managing director of SPI. Simon, please share with us your lessons learned during your 25 years of experience in executing infrastructure projects. Simon, over to you. Hello, and um, thank you for joining me today. It's my pleasure to spend a few minutes with you all um, to talk about BIM in practice and, and how that supports successful project delivery. First, I'd like to talk about the digital twin. Um, invented by NASA in the 60s, there were 15 interconnected simulators that were used to train astronauts and mission controllers um, in every aspect of the mission. And this included multiple failure scenarios. And some of those uh, came in useful to avert the disasters during both the Apollo 11 and Apollo 13 missions. Companies like GE and Rolls-Royce have embraced digital twins to speed up development um, and conducting destructive tests digitally. This saves months of program and millions of pounds. And they also monitor their engines in real time to identify uh, faults during flights to have mechanics and spares ready at the destination when the plane lands. I'd like to introduce the infrastructure digital twin and talk about the journey that we're taking to reach that destination. First, we should address um, the differences between BIM and twin. Uh, BIM brings a standardization to the way that we identify assets and it's the foundation for a digital future. I've simplified the definition to make it succinct. Um, for me, BIM is what the asset is, where it is, and what are its design parameters. And these things could include the manufacturer information, the energy consumption, the asset category and ID, um, how much recyclable content is in there. And, and there's a long list of things that are relevant to um, apply to, to BIM. And the twin is really aimed at asset owners and operators. What we're, what we're checking is how is it working compared to design and what can we do to improve performance. So the twin is generally looking at using the simulation and monitoring technologies all plugged in to the visualization model so that we can predict and optimize maintenance or find additional capacity um, with an ultimate goal of reducing operational costs or increasing resilience of the of the network um, but it could also be used for training and competency assessments so how does this all work in in practice so let's look at bim for design um, bim for design is a, a model-based approach which avoids clashes and, and rework and each designer produces individual models over a baseline model uh, usually a laser scan um, survey that's been converted to a, to a CAD format. And federation takes place in the common data environment where files are stored and edited and, and approved. And the federated model is then visualized for engineers to carry out checks and make comments. One of the most important parts of design management 
is the design coordination meeting. So using that model-based approach, that accelerates design development and shortens timescales. And it avoids wasting time and effort producing drawings until the coordination is all agreed. Uh, getting this process right here has a huge impact on the design program. Several stages of the design life cycle can be improved by up to 80% versus the traditional approach. And you'll notice here that there are no drawings on the table. There's just a big screen on the wall out of, shoot, uh, out of shot. Um, and, you know, this is how we've, we've learned to work now. And it's a very, very efficient way of, of developing designs. BIM for construction is, is primarily focused around the coordination of all the construction activities planned to take place and the engagement of investors and stakeholders um, and also for training of, of workers and, and crews. In this example of, of Real 4D, this is a, a planning methodology that integrates all the planners to create an integrated program which can be tested using the BIM model. Um, here we see five different contractors coordinating their site works and they're listed on the on the right hand side there and you'll see the colours appearing as the activities take place. Having this model allowed us to spot clashes on sites and, and optimise activities. Um, in this case we were able to coordinate several hundred activities in the programme during the closure of, um, closure of the railway during the Christmas period we were able to identify opportunities to increase both the volume of work, but also reduce the risk of the program uh, by identifying clashes early. And this resulted in a successful blockade and the, and the railway opened up on time. At Heathrow, uh, we utilized this new methodology to make it even easier. Um, we combined the BIM model um, with the schedule, but we used smart sheet technology and, and this allowed contractors and engineers and project managers who were able to uh, assess the impact of these activities on site without having to interpret a P6 program. They didn't need those expert planners or any software um, during the discussion and, and the coordination phase and they could just use the built-in planning capability in, in smart sheet. And once that coordination was complete, the planners could update the schedule once uh, with the agreed information, which reduced their workload massively. And the client was also able to visualize the schedule and provide useful feedback, which accelerated the works. BIM for construction is also used to carry out virtual site inspections and, and tours. Um, this allows people to collaborate with all of them going out onto site. That full 360 imagery is uploaded instantly uh, and the, uh, or is instantly available in the model for end users. So you can genuinely conduct virtual site tours from, from your home or, or office. For, um, by adding simulator technology, um, you can test scenarios and, and when sensors are added, you can monitor the current state for railways, this includes timetable verification, structure gauge check for train paths, maintenance optimization based on actual point movements, um, train dispatcher checks to understand is there, a, is there a pattern in the way that the optimal running of the railway versus how the dispatchers are running the railway. And the digital twin for airports could also include passenger flow optimization, ground crew training, even optimizing flight schedules. So to, to sort of recap, BIM is what the asset is, where it is, and, and what its design parameters are. And the twin is how is it working compared to design, and we use monitoring to, to do that. And what can we do to improve performance? And we use simulation to do that. And I've made a few notes on, on the, you know, a, re a recipe for a successful project. Define your requirements carefully. Specify correctly and you will be able to reduce the cost versus a traditional approach to project delivery. Create lean processes that enable collaboration. Configure your tools carefully to optimize efficiency. 
insist on collaboration between designers and also between contractors and keep it simple. If it feels like it's too hard, then something's not right. Um, and again, the, the recipe for an efficient asset is, is specify your operational needs early and only specify what you need or, what, or, or else your costs are going to increase. Everything's achievable, but it comes at a price. So you need to think carefully about what you need. Uh, manage change. Ensure you've got processes to track asset changes on site so you don't lose control and you don't have to keep going and spending money on surveys and surveys and surveys. And simulate often. Um, test scenarios early before commissioning lengthy feasibility studies. The simulation's there and you can put your requirements in there, you know, I want to run extra trains or I want to be able to handle more flights and we can use the simulator technology to, to do that. And also optimize your maintenance. Use the twin to provide insight into actual wear and tear and to inform predictive maintenance tools. Um, and this avoids unnecessary maintenance. So that's my time and that concludes my, my presentation. Uh, thank you for your, your attention. If you've got any questions or feedback, I'll be happy to um, answer them for you. Simon, thank you very much for your presentation and for showing us the practical aspects of digitalization in infrastructure. I am glad that together with SPI, we were able to organize the Smart Infrastructure Conference and I'm really convinced that your insights are valuable for the audience joining us today. What about switching the perspective? Uh, you'll have an opportunity to find out more about BEAM from Autodesk, which is one of the leaders in uh, transforming the architecture, engineering and construction industry. Simply saying, technology provider. Let's welcome Mr. Marek Suchotsky, one of Autodesk leaders. Marek, over to you. My name is Marek Suchotsky. I am the Infrastructure Industry Engagement Lead for Autodesk. My presentation today is called The Future of Making an Infrastructure. Before I commence, I am obliged to show you a safe harbor statement. Some of the content I will be showing refers to future investments that we are making, and we wouldn't want you to make a buying decision or investment based on this content. Technology-driven industry transformation. If you've ever driven a high-performance car, admired a towering skyscraper, used a smartphone or watched a great film, the chances are you've experienced what millions of Autodesk customers are doing with our software. We make software for people who make things. I recall when I was a young engineer, I started out on the drawing boards, just like this gentleman, using scale rules, set squares, ink and pen, and creating contextual designs using a paper-based metaphor. However, this was very difficult to make changes with. So Autodesk pioneered the development of computer-aided design, and AutoCAD is synonymous with what we now call the era of documentation, so electronic ink. Autodesk then took the industry forward into the era of optimization through the development of building information modeling, or BIM. And BIM is as applicable to infrastructure as it is to buildings. And when you have a model, you can then run subsequent analyses and optimize the solution to better meet the requirements. We're now entering what we call the era of connection, leveraging the power of the cloud to bring participants together and co collaborate on the optimization and optimization of solutions. So we build the right thing at the right time in the right place. Connected BIM isn't a technology as such, but more a end-to-end -end process around the design, build and operation of built assets. I won't be able to cover everything today, so I'm just gonna concentrate on solutions for design today. So let's reimagine the future of design. I'm going to cover five separate topics to give you a flavour of what's possible today. Let's look at advanced context modelling. Here we have a rich contextual model created from base geospatial vector and raster data. It's over, over a river in France into an industrial area. <clears throat> the engineer has plotted a new bridge, which is obeying engineering rules. So it is something that could be constructed in the real. But the designer, he or she is aware that there is some missing data. And through the partnership enabled by Autodesk and Esri, we can now link to one another's data sets dynamically, avoiding any interoperability issues and ensuring that the right data is available all the time to the right people. 
the engineer here is selecting the appropriate data set that they require, in this case pipelines, and they're bringing that pipeline data straight into the model. When, when the pipeline data comes in, the engineer is able to assess whether or not there is a conflict, and it appears we're okay, so the pipeline stops before we get to the bridge abutment, a bridge pier rather. However, we have a field engineer going out using a mobile Esri application and, check, uh, and checking if the, all the data was there. And as it turns out, actually no, there was a pipeline missed and a number of manhole covers had been missed when the data has been uploaded in the first place. Something that's not uncommon in our uh, asset management uh, challenges. So the field engineer digitizes the new uh, pipeline and manhole locations, which are then automatically uh, updated and uploaded to the uh, backend ArcGIS system. Now our designer can use the context modeling tool from Autodesk and just refresh the data set to check whether this new data gives us any more information. And in fact, what it has revealed is that there's a significant clash between the foundations of the bridge pier and the uh, pipeline. If we found this on site, it would be a very expensive uh, error, perhaps lead leading to abortive work or uh, worse still, some sort of damage to the pipe network. What we can do now is by using current up-to-date information, we can reposition the, the bridge pier, reorient it and avoid any challenges in the reel. Here's a model of the uh, region around the Eiffel Tower in Paris. The model is built from somewhere in the order of 350 point clouds with over 8,000 trees and 1,000 buildings, as well as many uh, um, uh, pieces of furniture such as benches and, and park lights. Why was this model built? Well, Paris will be hosting the Olympics in a few years' time, and it was noted that people visited the Eiffel Tower but didn't stay in the area because of a shortage of cafes, bars and restaurants. So the intention is to retain visitors and tourists in this region, and this model is now being given to successful design uh, competition winners in order for them to propose uh, improvements to the area. And I ask you, would you rather do your design conceptualizations and optioneering of a model such as this or a set of CAD drawings that would be limited and potentially inaccurate in their detail. So let's look at automatic feature extraction. So that Paris model, as I mentioned, was built off of a number of point clouds. And you could say, well, that's very hard to process and it's a very specialist activity. But what we're seeing here is a user of the Autodesk InfraWorks platform simply picking a set of dense points and saying, I think that's the top of the rail. The software then automatically extrudes those lines using a process called automatic feature extraction. These three dimensional polylines represent the top of the rail, perhaps the edge of a platform or a curve line, and can now be used in uh, the next stage of the engineering to create a rich topographic model uh, when sent to a, a full engineering application such as Civil 3D. So we have the point cloud process data now available to us, which we can cleanse and tidy up, creating a surface model. This surface model can also be further cleansed to take out superfluous uh, geometry. So we, we're left with the pure, uh, in this case, rail alignments that we can use for proposing new designs or creating a topographic model to look at earth movements that we might need to undertake. So simply going from a point cloud into engineering geometry is extremely simple today. Let's look at design automation as the next stage of uh, functionality that we can use. We're looking at a Dynamo, a scripting language that we have um, in Autodesk, linking a model from one application to another. In this case, the, uh, the Revit BIM model is linking to a reinforcing cage model, simply using the geometry of the Revit model to create the cage. And if the Revit model should alter, we just rerun the script to reposition the cage. Or let's look at a highway example. Here we have a highway where a designer wants to place some street furniture and lighting columns by using the geometry of the road alignment and a script. The designer simply says, place lighting columns at these intervals and offsets from the road center line. They might want to reduce the spacing. And again, simply adjusting a parameter allows the lighting column density to be increased. In the normal process, that would take a long time to undertake because it would be done by separate people. Here we're placing a number of street signs, again, using the alignment geometry as a reference plane, but picking up a component library and placing the appropriate component at the appropriate position. And we can easily insert or remove uh, elements using this approach. Finally, I'm going to show a crash barrier being placed again as part of the road geometry, something that once again would have taken a long time previously but can now be picked up automatically from the script. And it should we move the road alignment, the street signs, the uh, columns and the crash barrier can be moved automatically. 
Here's an example from the Gilian Lingjiang International Airport in China, where the Beijing Institute of Architectural Design designed uh, Terminal 2 to address a, a limitation in the capacity of Terminal 1, which took 6 million passengers every year. This beautiful conceptual design, however, needs to be physically manifested for a structure. So the China State Construction Engineering Corporation used Dynamo to script and create the structural form that has been built in the real. Let's move to model driven analysis and simulation. Here's an example from Norway, where the project team needed to consider local constraints, such as the uh, urban environment and the natural environment, in order to propose the best optimized rail solution and avoid any conflicts. To get stakeholder engagement, this model was created, showing all of the uh, areas under study, running simulations such as flooding, and providing a proposal that met the client's criteria, but also satisfied the needs of the local community. So each stakeholder was satisfied that this was going to be the most suitable solution, considering sustainable design, efficient infrastructure, and reduced environmental impact. In our COVID-19 world, we want to return to our uh, office spaces and our leisure facilities and our retail facilities. How can you be confident that the airflows are not uh, exposing you to any risk? Well, the adoption of computational fluid dynamics would be a perfect way to uh, demonstrate that ventilation is meeting the needs. Unfortunately, computational fluid dynamics is typically run as a specialist process and not uh, used in every project. Autodesk, however, has a mechanism by which we can take uh, standardized models such as from Revit, simulate the positioning of the airflows and prove that our facilities meet our demands or make recommendations for improvements. Once again, we're looking at the Paris model and looking at mobility simulation. Let's look at a traffic study around a junction improvement. Here we have congestion at two points. Why, what if we put in a roundabout? Instantly we have a improved traffic flow and less congestion. We can do these simulations not just for vehicles, but also for pedestrians. And let's look at crowd effects. Again, in our COVID-19 world, we do need to run these simulations to ensure social distancing is maintained and also explore the potential impact of uh, failures in the system, such as maybe one of the ticket barriers uh, not working correctly. What would happen? In this case, what we see is that queue lengths rapidly build up. And again, we want to make sure that we can uh, foresee these events in the physical, uh, in the virtual before we do it in the physical. The last area I wish to talk about is generative design. Here we're looking at a surface model of a potentially new uh, housing estate or office park. We've got foundations of building plots being uh, shown by the uh, engineer. And then using generative design, many thousands of iterations can be run to optimize the surface, minimizing material to be brought into site and off site or optimization of mass hall and creating a optimized design, something that no human being could ever hope to achieve. And once we have the optimized uh, mass hall model, we can then even run simulations such as water runoff to ensure that the proposal does not uh, run risks of things such as flooding. And my last example around generative design, which is now built into our Revit uh, modeling application, is running perhaps a COVID-19 scenario. How can we sustain and maintain a two meter social distancing within an office space or perhaps again, a retail or leisure facility? Well, let's look at a standard kit of furniture parts, perhaps the furniture we have or that we wish to buy in, and let the software go off and run thousands of iterations to place the furniture in the most appropriate orientation to meet our constraints of two meter social distancing and perhaps uh, lower occupancy within the uh, spaces. This is something that's readily available to everybody today in their Revit application. So I hope I've given you a very fast tour of what's possible in the future of making infrastructure. Autodesk is helping its customers move through the journey from CAD to BIM onto connected BIM today and exploring what constitutes the future of design. I'll leave the last word to Alan Kay. The best way to predict the future is to invent it. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Marek, for an exciting presentation. When we are considering technologies, we are thinking about standards. Our next speakers, Emilia Cardamone and David Matt, are executives of British Standards Institution, which is the world's first national standardization body. Emilia and David, the floor is yours. Hello, everyone. My name is David Matt, 
Director of Digital Product Certification at the British Standards Institution. And together with my colleague, Emilia Cardamone, for the next few minutes, we're gonna share with you some of the developments and trends in digital best practice for infrastructure. At BSI, we shape and support best practice across industries as a national standards body and a founding member of ISO and through our assurance and consultancy businesses. Governed by Royal Charter, we work for the public good, independent of government or shareholders, reinvesting or profit back into our business and supporting industry to build a resilient world. And this gives us a real focus on emergent and disruptive technologies. Most of our 84,000 clients and indeed our own people are outside of the UK. And so we're very much a global organization. For the built environment, we're involved throughout the whole sector from supporting and certifying smart city strategy and implementation, infrastructure, digital transformation, smart communities such as plazas, campuses, etc., smart buildings, down to the smart systems and products used to bring these smart strategies to life, with our mark of trust, the kite mark, being used as a benchmark for excellence and trust. Through our involvement at all these levels, we see clearly the great opportunity for digital technologies to support safe, secure and sustainable smart development, but also some of the key obstacles. And it is these we are working to overcome collaboratively with governments and businesses around the world. I'll now hand over to Amelia to talk through a couple of examples of recent projects to bring this to life. Thanks a lot, David. Hello, everyone. So before we deep dive in some example, let's set up the scene and how standards can help in the digital transformation in infrastructure. Recent studies have demonstrated that by 2050, 75% of global population will live in the cities. This highlights how cities need to address investment in order to create benefits for the citizens and these markets. But obviously, there are some challenges to overcome. Challenges can be things such as moving from innovation to global scale. Cities are normally working in silos nowadays, and that makes it hard to connect the dots across programs in order to release value. Buyers are not sufficiently engaged. And of course, there are trust and security concerns. On top of that, there's a complex standard and security landscape with loads of gaps. So in BSI, we have worked a lot on standard development because standard can address different needs of, this, of different stakeholders. We started with three main questions. Why smartness? And this is addressing strategy problems. How smart initiatives can be executed across multiple sectors? And this is linked to the process in order to release those values that we were talking before. And what kind of solution or application can be applied and, and is needed? And this is addressed in our technical specification standards. There are many standards to help you embed a wider digitalization. And those, as said, are aimed to address problems regarding strategy, process, and technical specification. When we are talking about digital transformation, we can look at things such as building information modeling, smart cities and communities, IoT and connected devices, and smart transportation. There are loads of standards out there helping you, leading and guiding you through the digital transformation. For example, if we're talking about smart cities and communities, there are loads of standards that can help you, such as ISO 37101, if you want to look at a management system for sustainable development, ISO 37106 for smart city operating model, ISO 37153 smart city infrastructure, ISO 37157 for smart transportation and so on. And then looking deeper into transportation or um, infrastructure, you probably want to look at building information modeling. Depending on what you are dealing with, you need to look at ISO 19650 standard framework 
And for example, if you need to look at the design and construction phase, you want to look at part two. Asset management phase, you want to look at part three. Or if you want to adopt a BIM security minded approach, you want to look at part five. BSI can offer a wide range of certification covering BIM, smart city, and IoT. So as David was saying, let's have a look at some case studies to see how certifications and the implementation of standards have, have helped organizations demonstrating tough leadership in the digital transformation. So let's start with smart cities. Station City in South Korea has been the first city worldwide to achieve the smart cities and community kite mark back in 2018. For those who don't know, Sejong City is the city in South Korea where government agencies sit, and it's a city built from scratch with the aim to be smart since the beginning. Of course, there was a big focus on the outcome and going through the certification process and being certified reassures the city and its citizens that services like public transit, security of infrastructure, waste infrastructure system is built for the citizens and that there are process and procedures in place that not only deliver better outcomes, but are aligned in international standards. And following Sejong, after its success, three other cities in South Korea have been certified, Daegu, Waseong, and Goyang. Having a defined view and roadmap is key in setting up future cities. The Land and Housing Corporation in South Korea part of the government, share this view and has been working closely with cities in order to have a common smart city development framework. Going down to building information modeling, we can have a look at our case study on RTA in the UAE. RTA is the Road and Transport Authority in Dubai. A plan being to the entire life cycle of the asset was key for RTA. Working in collaboration with BSI was also one of their other goals, and the adoption of partnership approach across the supply chain was mainly their first aim. Understanding benefit is key. Clients, such as government departments, specifying being correctly helps them in the collaboration and in the management of the information. So every stakeholder knows what to do and when. Being a client and an asset owner, RTA understood the benefits of BIM and made it a priority to ensure BIM becomes business as usual. Their project team is aligned with specific outcomes and benefits and specify means understanding and deliver better outcomes. RTA has been working collaboratively with BSI also in shaping our certification because ultimately their goal in stressing the collaboration through the supply chain and their main contractors was key in order to deliver their benef the benefits of them. Now I'll hand over it back to David which is going to summarize what we've said. Thank you Amelia. So the key to phrases you've heard there have been around outcomes and around collaboration. From our perspective, to develop a successful smart community of any type, there are three distinct act activity areas, strategy, process and technology. For some time, there's been a big focus on technology and clearly a huge opportunity with the resulting huge investment by organisations large and small. But without widespread implementation, their vision will not be realised. What's needed to move to a widespread implementation is for all the stakeholder groups to collaborate, understand how best to define the strategy and process and thereby work out how this technology can best deliver tangible outcomes. Standards are emerging at all levels to support a rapid change, as shown just now by Amelia, using global best practice. So wherever you sit across the strategy, process and technology areas, now is the time to collaborate understand how to best to shape your own activity in respect of the other areas and help drive forward towards that smart future that delivers on expectations safely, securely and sustainably. Thanks for your time.
Emilia and David, thank you very much for your presentation. We all know that standardization is crucial to create the unified environment for cooperation of all infrastructure stakeholders around the world. We have now reached the end of this first session. Uh, uh, let's have a short break to fill your mags with a coffee, but uh, please come back soon. Because uh, in the next part you'll have even more presentations and you will have a chance to join the discussion panel with our experts. Uh, see you soon uh, at 11.40.